I'm here today with Dr. Donna Olivia Owusu-Ansa, who uh, works as chaplain at Haven Hospice, located at JFK Medical Center, Edison, New Jersey, and is associate minister at the New Hope Baptist Church in Metuchen, New Jersey. But also, she just is coming out with a new book called Loves Regardless, which is a devotional book grounded in a woman's creative thought and technology. So uh, Donna also has been a participant in our Publishing Color conferences. And so it's really uh, an honor and a privilege and uh, fun to have Reverend Donna here with us today. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Brian. I am delighted uh, to be here with you today and to share with you uh, all about Loves Regardless. <laughs> good, good, good. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the book? What inspired you to write this? Uh, sure. Um, so interestingly enough, the seeds for this book were planted in 2009 uh, when I was a seminarian at uh, the Theological School at Drew University. Uh, I was talking with my uh, mentor, who's now mentor and friend, she was professor then, uh, Nancy Lynn Westfield, and we were talking about love. I remember we were having this really deep conversation about love. And around the same time, um, I had this desire, I was looking for a devotional book. I was looking for a devotional book, and I could not find one that spoke to me particularly as a black woman, right? And so, you know, Toni Morrison has said, uh, you know, that uh, you write the book that you want to read. Yes, I was just thinking of that quote. Yes. And so Love's Regardless is really the book that I wanted to read. Um, and it took some time. Um, I started, you know, this, the seeds were planted, like I said, in 2009. And then I started working on it a little bit in 2010, 2011. And then life just got busy. Um, I got married during that time, started a position at a church, had children, you know, all kinds of things kind of, you know, came up. And, and then in 2018, um, I attended the Publishing in Color Conference, the inaugural Publishing in Color Conference, which was really life-changing. So for anyone listening, if you have not attended, whether in person or virtually, I would suggest that you do so, uh, because it really is a, a phenomenal gathering. Um, I was inspired to write again. And so I remember the third third day. So I did the uh, first um, day with you, the um, kind of more intimate session. But the third day, I came home and I laid out all of my womanist books and all of my, um, you know, novels and, and poetry books and all of this. And I started working on it. And then life got busy again. <laughs> <laughs> and so in 2019, I picked it back up again. And I said, I'm going to do this now. And so I, at that point, I outlined the book. I had uh, been, you know, immersed myself in the works of Zora Neale Hurston and Toni Morrison, theologians like Dolores Williams, Lynn Westfield, um, you know, listening to the voices of um, my grandmother, uh, my late grandmother, and um, my grandmother, Gula, who's still with us today. She's 99 years old, um, you know, friends and so on and so forth. And really, and I outlined the book. I had the... Um, I had the entries, I had the themes, I had the quotations, scriptures, everything I would use. And then life got busy again, right? So that's the running theme, life, life got busy. <laughs> and um, in March, you know, we're hit with this global pandemic and we've, you know, had to shut down. And, um, and during that time, there were some memes on social media. I'm not sure if you saw them, but, it, you know, they said something to the effect of, you know, if you don't come out of this pandemic with a new skill, a hobby, a book, then you've wasted your time. <laughs> and I said, Foolishness. You know, we're dealing with a pandemic. There, you know, there is trauma that we're all experiencing. We have no idea the effect that it will have on us, you know. For many of us, all we can do is survive. We, you know, cook the 12 meals that our kids want every day, you know, work at home, you know, balance all of those things. So I kind of bucked against it. Uh, but around the end of March, I saw two, th two different days on Facebook um, in a group I belong to. One woman asked the question, if you wrote a book about your life, what, it would, what would it be titled? And so I put a title out there. I'm engaging on Facebook. And she kind of shot back quickly. Well, why haven't you written it? <laughs> okay. So that was the first day. And then the next day, I was in another group that I'm in for preaching women. And someone asked the question, does anyone know of a good womanist devotional book? I'm looking for <laughs> a devotional book. Oh, my goodness. 
<laughs> That's so funny. <laughs> and so I said, well, I guess now is the time to really sit down with this and write this book. Um, so at that point, that's the end of March, and I had three, I had the entire book outlined. Most of the introduction was written. I had three of the 40 entries written. And so between the end of March and the uh, beginning of June, I, um, I, you know, did the work my soul must have, as Reverend Dr. Katie Cannon uh, often said. So I, I sat down with it, and I worked through it, and I wrote it, and I, I, I met God as I was writing it. So, and, and sometimes it was writing and other times it was just my devotional time. Um, and so that's kind of what inspired and how it, how it came to be. Wow. That's really great. I mean, uh, like you said, life happens and um, we have to adjust and pause and, but it's really great that you stuck with it, you know, and you came back to it so many times and, and actually got it done. And I think now, honestly, because of the experiences that I've had over the past, you know, 10, 11 years, the book is richer now hmm. than it would have been had I written it in 2010. Sure, you know? sure. Uh, that makes so sense. Life getting in the way was really life happening to um, cultivate the soil that was necessary for the book to be produced in this way. So tell us a little bit about how you came up with that title and like, what is that? mean relating to the book? Yes. Um, so it is, like I said, a womanist devotional book um, grounded in womanist uh, thought uh, and theology. And, um, and I was working with Alice Walker's uh, definition of womanism that she writes, uh, that she wrote rather in In Search of her, uh, Our Mother's Gardens. And that definition um, has four parts. But the third part of the definition, she writes that a womanist loves music, loves dance, loves the moon, loves the spirit, loves love and food and roundness, loves struggle, loves the folk, loves herself regardless. Ah. So the title is really a play on her definition, um, but also this idea that black women love deeply and fully and despite, um, you know, the uh, despite racism, despite patriarchy, despite classism, and all of those um, uh, multiple oppressions that we face, that we continue to love regardless. And so it's a nod to both Alice Walker's definition of womanism, but also the um, lived experiences of Black women in the United States. Wow, that's cool. I, I did not know that um, connection. So that, uh, that really explains a lot, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> So um, what was the experience you had like writing it in terms of, you know, what it meant to you, what you learned from it? Um, I learned a couple of things. One is that I actually could write a book. I finished it. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably the main thing. It is possible. It is doable. Huh? Um, and then I also, um, I mean, the experience was, it was beautiful for a number of reasons. One, just you know, as I shared, there were times when it was simply, I, I understood the writing process as my own devotional time with God. And so, you know, getting up in the morning and making a fresh cup of coffee in the quiet hours, I have, at the time, they were five and seven years old. So I have allowed five and seven year old uh, daughters who, you know, sometimes it's impossible for them to write, uh, for me to write when they're around. I've learned to do that too. Um, <laughs> beautiful just getting up in the quiet of the morning and meeting God during that time and, and writing. And then, um, you know, there were some challenging moments during the writing process. Um, <clears throat> although the book kind of took 11 years to produce, in many ways, it took three months to produce. That was, you know, the real nitty gritty writing time. And so there were, there was, I remember one week in particular, I had nothing. I mean, I would get up every day, I'd, you know, make my coffee, I'd have everything, I'd sit at the table and nothing. And at the end of that particular week, I was so frustrated. Uh, and I have a, an accountability partner who kind of walked me, walked with me through this. And every Friday I would check in with her. And I remember that Friday saying, I don't know if I can do this. I, I didn't write anything this week. And, and the following week, um, uh, is when, you know, we were dealing with COVID-19, but the following week was kind of when 
the news broke, or and we were also kind of hearing a bit about Ahmaud Arbery, you know, um, kind of in the background and his senseless murder. But uh, around that time, George Floyd was murdered, and then you know the world was on fire, or our nation was on fire, and at the same time, so that that next week, the week after I couldn't write, was when I was working on the section called Loves uh, the Folk. And really that, that section has um, uh, devotional entries on righteousness and truth and justice and revolution. And, um, and I now realize they were challenging to write, but I also at that time was writing for Black women on, who were protesting, Black women who were lamenting, Black women who were mourning during this time when there was so much uh, crisis in our nation. Uh, and then, of course, you know, Breonna Taylor was killed. And, uh, and, you know, we still have not had an arrest for one of her killers. And so I was thinking about the Black women whose voices either heard or, or unheard or snuffed out and writing for their spiritual nourishment during that time. So, you know, even the week that I thought I was frustrating and I did nothing, in many ways was preparing me for the next week of writing, where I was wow. writing in the midst of what was going on. Did you feel like you had someone to write to more so? Yes, definitely. Um, you know, I, there was the, the piece, let me see if I can find it, I wrote, um, you know, about um, how Breonna Taylor's mother could no longer call her name, you know, and what that, what that feels like, and yet knowing that God knows the names of Black women. So it was just, it was, you know, and, and sometimes I think we need to hear that. And so, um, so the experience was, it was joyful and it was challenging. Uh, it was stretching. Um, uh, it was beautiful in that, you know, when I wrote about my grandmother um, who died when I was 10 years old, I could, it was as if I was back in North Carolina with her in 1987, you know, so, um, you know, so that was, that was the experience and I wouldn't trade it for the world, um, even those frustrating moments. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm sure, you know, there were some of both, right? And, and it sounds like the one with your grandmother was probably one of the more joyful yes. parts of that. Are there others that were either really positive or really challenging for you? Um, I think those were the most challenging, um, the most joyful, I think. So each entry is, gra is grounded in some womanist, in scripture, and also some womanist thought. So a quotation from either a novel, a poem, uh, a womanist theologian, that they're not included in the book. Uh, one, because getting the permissions would have taken 10 years, especially in this crisis. So I took them out. But also, I realized that my words could stand alone. Hmm. But, um, you know, it was, it was great engaging with those women um, whose names we know. But I just also found joy when I wrote about, like I said, my grandmother or my, my best friend Courtney's Aunt Elsie uh, or my, you know, girlfriend Kimberly's um, grandmother, uh, Luella, knowing that their voices, their experiences, um, that we can hear God in them as much as we do the theologians and scholars who are in the academies. So those, that was joyful for me. Good, good. Wow. So um, how do people order the book? Yeah, Amazon. Okay. <laughs> available on Amazon. Actually, I'll hold up a copy of the book. There's one behind me too. Um, but uh, they can go on Amazon and search for Loves Regardless uh, or search my name, Donna Owusu Ansa. And there it will be. It's available in paperback and in, for a Kindle download as well. Okay, good, good. And I know your website is reveranddonnao.com. Yes, ReverendDonnaO.com, correct. Yeah, that's that's easy, easier to spell, at least for me. Yes, <laughs> ReverendDonnaO.com. And if you go to the website, there's a page for Loves Regardless. There's actually a button to click to go directly to Amazon. So that's another good, way. Good, 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 good. So what are your hopes for this book? Um, my hopes, uh, one is um, that, it, that in this time that we're in, particularly with um, – 
uh, as we're in the midst of this pandemic and sheltering in place as things begin to open up, but also with the climate in our nation is that the book would really uh, be a source of nourishment, um, particularly for black women, but I've had uh, women and men of other races who have purchased the book who have found encouragement uh, in the book as well, so that it would be a source of spiritual nourishment um, and joy as well. Um, I'm hoping that it starts discussions. Um, so I'm launching in September a 40-day devotional group that will meet on Zoom uh, at 7.15 in the morning uh, for 40 days, and we will walk through it together and journey together through the devotional group. So I'm Excellent. hoping... Well, so please, please send me a link to that when, when, it, when you're ready yes. so that I can get the word out about that too. Absolutely, will do. Will do. Cool, cool. Um, and then I've also put together, um, it's in pre-production, uh, what's called Love Notes. And this is a companion journal um, because writing, I think, is such a uh, spiritual exercise. I consider it one of my spiritual disciplines. Um, and I know so many uh, who write uh, as they hear from God and write when they're emotional work. So that I um, created this companion journal so that women or anyone who purchases it can also um, write their thoughts, their experiences um, as they're walking through the book. Uh, so those are my hopes. And then also selfishly, part of my hope was to, and I've got two beautiful uh, daughters uh, who are growing up in this world. Part of my hope was to inspire them, um, not necessarily to be writers, though if they do that, that's great, but to do whatever it is their soul desires. Cool, cool. So, um, as you well know, I'm kind of a big uh, believer in platform development. So, can you talk about any steps that you've taken in that direction to try to, you know, build awareness for your book and what you've been doing? Yes, I'll talk about it. So, um, I've, you know, I'm on social media. I've been on social media, no stranger to social media. Uh, but my social media was, um, very, was uh, private up until this point. And I realized that there's, you can't build a platform in that way. So one of the things that I've done is just simply to open up my platforms um, and to uh, engage um, also in more uh, writing groups and uh, groups for theologians and preachers and women. And um, so I think it's just kind of, uh, I actually learned this from you. I learned a couple of things from you, but you have to be out there. <laughs> And so I think part of platform building is just being out there, being present, um, and then also learn this from you in our session uh, during Publishing in Color, is to be consistent. And so uh, in that platform uh, development, I've been you know, consistent in, in uh, my posting on social media and finding uh, tools to do so, so that it, you know, it's automated, so that I'm not up at 6 a.m. every morning posting. <laughs> well, good for you, excellent student. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's awesome, that's really good to hear. Yes, uh, so that's part of it. And then I'm still learning. You know, one of the things, I, so the book is self-published on Amazon through their Kindle Direct Publishing. Um, and one of the things I've learned about um, author, I, I think I've known this about authors, but especially self-published authors, is that you also have to have an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and so I'm uh, developing that muscle, which I think was latent <laughs> prior to this. Well, good for you. That's, that's just so all wonderful to hear. <laughs> so um, what about uh, the future? Um, have you got any book ideas uh, percolating that you're uh, either working on or thinking about working on? I do. I do. Um, one of which will, I know for sure, kind of has to wait for some life experience, uh, a particular, actually not even life, a particular vocational experience. Um, it's an idea that I've been sitting with for a while. Um, just uh, about women in ministry and the ways in which um, women approach pastoral ministry in a very different way and what can be learned from that for all in ministry. So that's one of the ideas that's been percolating. Um, I did a, a workshop uh, in May for the United Missionary Baptist Association of Metropolitan New York and vicinity on um, developing uh, Christian maturity 
uh, titled Bearing Fruit. And uh, when I was done with it, uh, several people said that should be a book. And so that may be a book. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> that. And then I've been thinking about toying around with the idea, um, because my daughters have been such an integral part of this process with me, from designing the cover. I mean, my daughter just, even before getting on with you, mommy, let me see your shirt. Okay, does your makeup match your shirt? <laughs> Things um, that, they, that they've really had ownership in this process. So I've been thinking about what it might mean to write a devotional book, um, for with them, for them, for um, uh, for young girls of color. So that's another idea. Um, and but you know, I talked to um, Lynn Westfield, uh, your friend, my mentor, uh, last week, and she said once you write the first one, then you know that's it. It opens up the floodgates, and so we'll see. Um, oh, good for you! That is so excellent to hear that you've got all those different ideas, and you know becoming more entrepreneurial and branching out in new directions. That's all really awesome to hear. Yes, thank you. <laughs> it's, a, Donna, it's an experience. Good, 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 good. Well, Donna, it's, it's sure been a pleasure to speak with you and catch up with uh, all the things that you've accomplished uh, since we first met, you know, at the early stages of publishing in color. So congratulations on all of that. And uh, so happy for you. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you for uh, hosting me on this platform. Thank you for all of the work that you continue to do uh, for um, in, in publishing for spiritual writers. It really, the work that you do is a gift, which means that you are a gift. And so I thank you for what you do and who you are. Well, thank you so much. It's a uh, uh, labor of love. But, uh, but in any event, please keep us posted, you know, and stay in touch uh, so that we can keep up with uh, all the things that you do next. Excellent. Thank you so much.